Hello, what is going on YouTube people? People out there in the YouTube universe. This is like my fourth video today. Let me see what date is it? What time is it? So, <clears throat> on and off, I've been doing about four videos today, but they all have been error filled, crashed, and exploded. Um, I've been doing this since about 10 o'clock, and in between encoding time and my computer just stopped encoding my stuff. <laughs> which kind of sucked. I, um, <clears throat> I finally figured out what the problem was and think I now think I'm ready to go. DFH can, you know, controls your, um, how much available space you have left. Well, I had like four, 400 megabytes or something and it just would, it would encode about 400 megabytes and then stop encoding because I had no more space on my hard drive. Right? Alright. And I also went to some areas such as VAR, which I'd like to talk about real quick. <clears throat> I'm going to say this. First, first I'm going to say, to keep it cool, I don't have anything to rant about today. I don't. I had a couple days off, and you know what? It, the sun is not shining over here, so weather is not a factor in my rant. <laughs> But the sun is not shining. It's cold outside. I have a nice, tall, warm cup of coffee. So we should be rant-free until I either run out of matches or or my coffee dips below 72. So right now I think it's about 85. And because I'm long-winded, it'll probably dip below 72 in like the next 15 minutes. So around at 15 minutes, I'll probably have a rant. <laughs> but I won't. I won't. Uh, um, what I would like to say, that's how you get up and go get a lighter when you're talking. What I would like to say is, I'm going to talk about the Linux file system, okay? Um, I'm going to show you some, some, some contrast to Linux and DOS, okay? In a non-abusive, Windows user-friendly type of manner atmosphere. <laughs> Alright, and <clears throat> I'm going to show you that, and I'm going to show you that right now, okay? Super. Oh, and DOS EM EMU, because that's, uh, this is it, how I came across um, what I wanted to discuss on this tutorial. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Three, two, let's go, right? So, where are we now? We're in the root of our file system. We can't go no lower than where we are right now. Present director, working directory. Look at that. Bang. All right. So if you look, <clears throat> I know you've probably been here before. We've all come here, but been too scared to touch anything in here because we don't know what the hell's going on back here. Well, I would like to point out this directory here and take about three minutes of your time <clears throat> to show you what's going on in here. If you go into the var folder, what the var folder pretty much does is, um, it, it, I hope you can see the log right there, okay? Um, let's see the into the log, okay? Not many people tell you what's going on back here, or you have to read it. I hate reading. So, <clears throat> shrink it up a little bit, and we'll see here, this is full of all kind of logs that we can access, okay? all kind of logs we can access. Let's take a look at a few of them right now. Alternatives, I don't know what that is. All we have to do though is come in here, if you can't get root permissions, maybe say sudo and get root permissions and just take a look at everything. Don't change too much about what's going on back here, but let's take a look at everything. Not only that, um, let's take a look at these and see who owns them. Okay? Look at this. Syslog. Who owns this stuff? Oh, stop. Slow down. Come back. Window, come back. Ooh. <laughs> Look who owns these things. Root. Syslog. Yes, yeah, Syslog owns Auslog. Okay? Root. Syslog owns that. Root. All this stuff is owned by Syslog. Mail Warn is owned by syslog messages is owned by syslog um, mysql is owned 
owns owns if you have a server if you have a MySQL server okay owns that the speech dispatcher actually owns stuff and shared by root right add add ADM I don't know if that's admin I don't know why that would be admin you temp okay 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 um let's look at that stuff is done now <clears throat> that's only in the in the var folder I could take you on a wild ride to where <clears throat> we could actually look at what kind of stuff is owned on our computer by other things and what I want to point out here is a, a tragic 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 blooper that I did um, a few operating systems ago on my Linux machine my Ubuntu 1010 on my um, laptop 64, 64 Intel was I went into the root file system I cd it into root okay <laughs> let's go there let's look around can we say LSL okay it's not going to show us unless I descend into some folders but I cd it into root and what did I do because I was having a heck of a problem with file permissions and you know if you write <clears throat> if you write to um, if you create folders in certain locations like this area here I created a folder in here and blah 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 and I was trying to move stuff to it and it was giving me you know error um, you know a, a permission denied stuff like that so I said you know what I'm tired of all this permission denied crap and blah 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 and I'm the root user because I was sudo at the time I w I'm the root user and I should have unlimited access to everything in here so I don't care so what did I do I said chone negative r do not type this in I said chone negative r um Dougie that's my username or no no I think I said root yeah I changed it all to root change negative r root <sighs> all and what that did was killed my operating system all right it booted like in some funky safe mode and blah 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 and everything else <laughs> and it was terrible so nonetheless I want to say look at this here see this is owned by root and owned by mail okay this is owned by root and my root are owned by staff you know um we'll cd into um, mail log okay and like i said <clears throat> all this especially this stuff here all this stuff the ownership got changed to root so syslog no longer had permissions to write to it so if it had to do something to boot psh, yeah right you're not gonna get to it anymore <laughs> alright so never ever ever never ever ever change um change your ownership permissions on a recursive <laughs> or verbose recursive and verbose never change everything watch your wild card alright watch the wild card when you change the permissions in the root folder alright because if you change it all man I'm telling you you gotta redo your operating system I did it been there done it and I, I was doing it like out of oh this is a necessity I don't I'm tired of being restricted and tired of logging in as root all the time to move things around and blah 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 and I'm tired of this so hey let me change it all yeah right I rebooted it and that operating system lasted for about another I don't know six seconds and I said oh hell with it and it was on to another install and that's that now back to the log folder I'm sorry I'm long-winded in the long <laughs> in the in the long-winded way let me tell you about <laughs> let me tell you about what's in here and in, in actual uh, var log folder not too many people I don't think talk about this and we can do something like say cat let's cat out let's cat out something that looks heavy duty auth log all right this is all your logs oh i i ran that program uh user root yeah my command was uh, user bin free up yeah that's before i started making a video i made that to free up my um my ram okay um let's cat out daemon log okay 
You see a whole bunch of stuff over here. Uh, owned by look, yeah, look, look at these um, group IDs and user IDs. This is definitely why you don't you don't want to change group IDs and user IDs and permissions in the um, the root of your OS. All right, not recursively anyway, because it's gonna look at that. It would just shred everything, everything in here. And that's the <clears throat> that's the logic I came up with is okay I could try to fix it or I mean I could try to fix it but there's so many users that control certain things back here I might as well just reinstall my operating system because then they have folders that depend on folders and links and everything else and there's no way there is no way for me to actually do that with an efficient time okay so mm -mm. had to be a new install on that bad boy Let's look at another folder. Um, cat, let's cat boot. Uh, nothing has been logged yet. Okay, let's cat the other boot. Boot.log. Okay. And you see here, this is when you boot up your hard drive or your operating system. Uh, check a fast, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this, this gets logged when you boot up your operating system. Okay. See here, um, dev sdc2, which I'm using right now, blah, blah, blah. It kind of looks like if you had this on verbose, if you had, um, if you were running your your machine on verbose at boot, this is the kind of stuff that you would see, and then you would have to log in down here, okay? And then all this stuff would clear it up, and all this stuff would go away, right? Well, <clears throat> this stuff here, oh, phew, inet.d, by the way, is telnet. That's a bad thing to run, like, at boot on your computer. Telnet is very unsecure. Go SSH. Get, get rid of Telnet if you can. Alright? Or disable Telnet. Matter of fact, I think I'm running Telnet right now. Sure thing. Let's <laughs> let's do a net stat and see if I am running Telnet. T T P U L N. I like to use those switches. Let's see. Telnet uses Oh, pseudo. Pseudo net stat. Uh, net stat. Stat. Net stat. Dot T P U L N uh, S S H Yep, see? Look at that. I am so unsecure. If you're on my network right now, you'd be like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> let, me, let me take some stuff from you. Alright. So don't run telnet at boot. Do not run telnet at boot. Um there's ways you can configure that to shut that down. Matter of fact, I can say something like right now, sudo su. Um let me say, let me say, um, Etsy, init.d, um, tell, or what was it, inet? Air, air bounce. Init.d, telnet, I don't think it's telnet. Init.d, uh, where is it? What does it look like? Inet, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Okay, I'm stopping because nobody else is on my. Thing that's really a security risk but say if you're on a laptop if you're on a laptop and say you're in a public place like you like to go you know coffee or you know if you want to go steal somebody's internet at the library blah 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 somebody else is there too and you never know who's going to be smart enough to go ahead and start peeping in your stuff be careful with telnet seriously let's cat out the d message d d message d message log Okay, D message uh, deals with I think pack uh, files. Like if you do, f I, I don't know what D message does. I do know that you have to run that or D package. Let's cut out D package. I do know when you get a package that gets like broken when you're downloading it, saying you get interrupted or whatever, you gotta um, run D D package on your stuff to kind of clean it up so it can start to put better data down. All right, so that's the kind of stuff that you find here. Um, PM, PM, cat, cat, PM, or cat power management suspend log. Okay, that's when your computer like suspends because it times out or power man. It's power management. Come on, you know what I'm saying? So that's what you get. Success, suspend. That's all you get. These are all the logs back here. And um, let's cat syslog. Syslog. <clears throat> if anybody's ever installed a Gen 2, you do know you we have to install syskaylog, you know what I'm saying? And then add it um, to your runtime levels and everything else like that. This is syslog. 
alright, and it's a system log. So, <clears throat> you know, uh, blah blah blah. Kernel. I want to look at the kernel logs real quick and then we'll leave. Okay. Cat. Kernel log. There it is. This is all the stuff that's going on in your kernel. Okay. Okay. This is a uh, virtual box drive successfully loaded version, blah, blah, blah. You know, this is all kernel. Maybe one day if I ever get good enough and brave enough, you have to prevent what? I have to, oh my god, what's going on? Counter framework. Oh no. <laughs> one day if I ever get good enough, <clears throat> I'm going to try to use assembler and C to maybe interface with my kernel so I can print messages out in the kernel. Why? Because it's, um, that's pretty cool. And <laughs> not only is it pretty cool, what can you use it for, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's programming, it's, it's interfacing with hardware. And I want to interface more in my life with hardware. So, if we put, if we go now and say, let's cat mail log info, right? One time. Mail log. Mail log dot one. Okay, SMP. Oh wow. Maybe I should change that at some time in my life. So you guys would see that. Can you do anything with it? I don't know. You guys wouldn't do that to me, would you? Yeah, right. There's some sick dude out there like, yeah, I heard about you. I spent all day in my room. Think about how I can hurt people. Don't hurt me. Please. <laughs> don't hack my port. Um, pulse audio, that's under the user log. Alright, so, alright. Alright, we're done. We're out of here. Okay? Now, I wanted to show you that because this is where I came to look for why in the hell did my system keep spitting out videos that would, like, not play? And why would it stop encoding all of a sudden at, like, 48%? Blah, blah, blah. I came here to look for that. That didn't work. Alright, I had to figure it out on my own, but <clears throat> I thought it would be nice to show you, one... Who owns your operating system in the background? Like I said, what kind of owners are actually back here? Okay, this ties in perfectly to what I'm going to say about the Linux file system. Who owns this stuff? What writes to this stuff? And what's running? All right. And not only that, but what what goes on? As you saw, kernel cat kernel dot log. Um, the kernel dot log, we'll say it's right here. All right, <clears throat> what is the kernel doing? All right, and like you can you you can read this. You can you can read this. This is the kernel. What is the kernel doing? The kernel is hardware performance. I don't know. I don't know, but I know it's doing stuff that you know we wouldn't expect it to do, right? We wouldn't expect the kernel to, in, in the two minutes before this, uh, I showed you vir virtual box. Hey, you look at it. let's use grep, man. Cat kernel dot log grep i v box. <clears throat> v box. Why is why why is the kernel doing this? Why is the kernel so possessive in our back end? Why is our kernel handling all this information? Why is this happening? The kernel is great. The kernel is maintained. The kernel is super. Okay? The kernel is in everything. And this is the stark difference in contrast in between the Linux kernel and the DOS kernel. Okay? DOS, yes. DOS has a kernel. DOS has a kernel. But it does not interface the way it does not interface the way as it would with a Linux file system. And the thing is about all this is that the kernel is in every facet that we possibly can imagine. The kernel handles everything that we can possibly imagine. For instance, where we are now, right here at the terminal, the kernel um, control alt T if anybody ever wants to start their terminal without doing that uh, clicking on anything and F11 for me on Ubuntu machine is full screen you can also hit control shift plus plus 
to make it a little bigger so you can see it or anybody else can see it. The kernel is in every facet that we can possibly imagine. Okay? The control the, the kernel is a control layer is 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 ugh, I got it written down. Man, I can't I'm long winded and all but man, I can't remember for crap. The the Linux kernel is in everything. And it provides a different layer of abstraction for us to work through, okay? So basically, when we come in here and we do something like LS, alright, it's it, it the kernel is the one that actually gives us that authority. It doesn't matter if we're root or not, alright? Whenever we want to talk to the system, whenever we want to write to disk or anything else like that, we have to go through the, the layer of abstraction into the kernel okay and the kernel handles all that stuff for us all right now unlike the DOS machine who must have also have a kernel but with that machine you're writing strictly right from RAM into the contents of your hard drive whatever like that we can write to our hard drives too of course if not we would never be able to save data yes we can but we access the kernel and not only not only do we access the kernel our programs access the kernel okay and our programs get managed by the kernel and the way that they put their stuff down on on drive okay so the kernel is definitely the governor of this situation here and I'm sure the DOS kernel uh, alright put it like this the Linux kernel is is definitely definitely um, a, a high-tech thing all right deeper than I know about all right but these people <clears throat> these people invested the time in this all right and figured it out now with the Windows system which is built on DOS okay the Windows system uses command and all that stuff it's built on DOS all right and DOS is like 1983 previously to 1983 technology why do I say that Windows doesn't get rid of a lot of things okay Windows can't get rid of a lot of things because if they did like I said it would break okay they can fix things but they can't fix these major core fundamental things of the operating system so of course if they were to remove that it would break so their alternative is to restrict you from even going down that low and try to figure out a way to hold over while they go ahead and build on some more crap so <coughs> FYI <coughs> DOS, <clears throat> DOS came from what was reverse engineered, reverse engineered, okay, by a guy, I don't know his name, <clears throat> he reverse engineered a program called CPM, <clears throat> okay, CPM was made by a guy called uh, Gary, 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 Gary Kildall this is not spelled right CPM came from a man named Gary Kildall who made it <clears throat> as a basic operating system it was one of the earlier operating systems back in the day Unix ruled the world Unix ruled the world you know AT&T Bell Labs and all that stuff like that right Unix great operating system blah 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 but you had to license it okay and there's no restriction on you creating your own operating system why not you know what I mean? This is this is the free world. This is how things are done. You know what I mean? <clears throat> so, Gary Kildall made CPM. And it was reverse engineered by a guy. And he named it QDOS. QDOS was short for Quick and Dirty OS Operating System. Okay? And that's right from the video. From the dude, though. I could dispute that and say that's a, that's, that's a slang term, but hey, I don't know. That, that guy said it. <clears throat> so he reverse engineered it and called it QDOS. Windows came around and bought it because it did not have an operating system. They had programs. They had programs. They had a GNU. Basically, they had a GNU. They had programs to run on a machine, but they did not have their own operating system to put them on. They did not own the rights to CPM or QDOS okay and they bought I wanna say bought CPM but I'm not sure they bought it for like basically 
basically, without confusing names, Windows bought DOS, whatever form it may have come in, QDOS or the previous CPM. Windows bought DOS for $50,000, okay? And and not licensed it for $50,000, not $50,000 a copy, bought it for a flat outright price of $50,000, okay? And then they took it and, and turned it around um, with IBM and sold licensing to IBM for, I don't know, however, what can you say, 20 bucks a computer? I don't know, all right? But I'm sure <laughs> we all know Windows made their money on DOS, all right? But it's like 30-year-old technology, you know what I'm saying? If it was in 83 or previously to that, psh, it's 30-year-old technology. And it's the same thing, say, GNU. <clears throat> GNU used the Linux, the Unix operating system for a lot of its programs, okay? Um, and it, it only used the Unix operating system because of the kernel, the Unix kernel. The Unix kernel, um, or the Unix, the Unix OS <clears throat> was stable enough, and basically, Rich Stallman and all those great guys, all those gods, um, contributed to the GNU project, GNU, or <laughs> GNU's not Unix, okay, GNU's not Unix, <clears throat> they all contributed to this, and they made programs when I like that, but they were still lacking one core fundamental thing, and that was a kernel that was stable, okay, and they didn't want to do any licensing at all to use the, the Unix kernel, As a matter of fact, I don't think he could, well, not for their mission anyway, alright, so that's why Linus Torvalds was, um, very, very influential in this, and in that he came up with the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel was a Unix clone, okay, actually, as a Minix clone, Minix and Unix, Unix, and then split Minix by Andrew Tannenbaum, actually, I might put one of his videos up, because, you know, he's not too bad of a guy, thinking about it, even though Linus cusses him out all the time, <laughs> you should see some of the, uh, the uh, emails exchanged back in 91 over the Unix or 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 over the Minix slash Linux debates um, when they were pretty much hashing it out and maybe I'll try to figure out how to put that somewhere around my channel too but that's really interesting to see that but um, <clears throat> the <laughs> the Linux kernel which is a big C program okay, was compatible with all these GNU programs that were already written, alright, and that's where we got our Linux operating system from, stable kernel with a lot of user submitted programs that just ran and the support and the internet and everything else like that, I'm very sorry to be so long winded about this, but this is what I need to talk about, now, <clears throat> like I said, the kernel does everything in our operating system. Okay? Okay. Even the terminal is not... The terminal is not on a one-to-one -one basis. Okay? In the Linux operating system. It's not on a one-to-one -one basis. It has to go through a layer of abstraction okay and this is true this is true well don't believe it because I said it but this is true believe it because they've said it all right the people who've done the kernel believe it because they've said it and with DOS it's not so much that situation okay like I said the DOS, DOS may have a kernel but definitely does not operate the way that ours does all right and it theirs is more on a personal level on a one-to-one -one basis okay and back in the day you have to figure out the time frame what was going on back in the day back in like 83 you had Commodore right you had early computing back in the day early computing all right and early computing was for one they were not worried about viruses and bugs and all kind of things and all that crap they were pretty much just worried about getting the daggone thing up and running, okay? And you know what? They didn't even have enough RAM for bugs. They didn't have enough RAM for, like, crazy-ass viruses that would take your stuff and send it all the way to Nova Scotia. 
They didn't have enough for all that. There was the internet was very weak. All right, <clears throat> so they didn't have to prepare for all that, and that's okay. That's okay. But like I said, when you have Windows that just builds on previous stuff, those things will be a problem later on in usage. All right. <clears throat> but <clears throat> the DOS machine works more on a one-to-one -one basis. Okay. Now let's let's say this and prove this to yourself. I'm going to go to my home Doug desktop into my um, DOS tutorials and I'm going to say C. I'm going to go into my C file that I created in there. Let me dump out. Let me hex dump out my A dot out, my executable file format. Okay, I'm going to dump this out into RAM. I'm going to take a look at it. Actually, I should have popped it up one notch. Because that's all I need to go. This is my executable file format of my a.out file. Okay? I want you to take very careful notice at this. Okay? I want you to take very careful notice and ask, where is this? This is like virtual memory. That That's probably the wrong word. This is virtual memory that this is reading from. Look at these addresses. These addresses start at the beginning of the file name. Okay? These addresses start at the beginning of the file name. Now, who Nelly. Let me go. Let me pop open another window. I'm going to say sudo um, dos emu. And we'll look at where these addresses start up with dos. Okay? Clear dir. Um, let's go, let's, you know what, let's just say clear debug. Okay? And let's dump out addresses. Look at where we are. Look at where we have been dropped off. I hope you can see this. You know what? I'm not a miser. Take this screen. Look at where we start off. We start out at a different memory location. This means nothing. This data segment means nothing. This is default for the debugger to dump us out at, at an address 100. Okay, sure, fine, we'll roll with it. But, but take a look at where we start out. We start out a place somewhere in memory. And I could be very wrong, but I think that um, DOS picks out a spot that is free and open and a spot of your hard drive where you can then put stuff. This is a direct gateway back into the back end of your machine. All right? Through RAM, yes, of course. Now can we say RCX, let's move this, um, the CX register, code segment register, let's set that to 0000. zero, 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 zero. Can we do that? Dump. Pff, dump. Data segment. Zero, zero, quad zero. Dump. Code segment. Quad zero. All right. <clears throat> now if you were to do this on a physical machine, matter of fact, I did a video on it. I did a handheld phone video of this, all right, and I found bootlog.txt. Now, where in RAM is bootlog.txt? Where should bootlog.txt be in RAM? Exactly, all right. That was from the hard drive. This is directly into the hard drive. We don't have that problem. We don't have that problem because look at where these um, addresses are. This is pointing to a lowest of the low address. <clears throat> Alright? Address 10, that's 16 bytes from 0. Right? Right. Alright? Of course, of course this A.out program is not going to run when we boot the computer, so this must be virtual memory. Okay? This must be virtual RAM or something. I don't know, I'm not, I'm not that deep in the OS, but this must be a virtual type of memory that this prints it out to. Okay? Okay. Now, <clears throat> to prove my point on that one more time, like I said, when our terminal, our terminal runs um, as a user service, okay? That's been said by the people who even made Linux, all right? But we can actually take a look at that right now. If I was to say something like this, PSOX, I'm going to look around. I don't see nothing. I'm going to go to another window. Okay? Control-Alt-T opens up another terminal. 
Okay. Now I'm going to go back over here. <laughs> okay. Now, let's say pseudo sue. Let's be root. Okay. Oh, oh, oh my god. Oh my god, not caps lock. Okay. Now I want to say PSOX. Okay. I want you to see something down here at the bottom. <clears throat> PTS slash zero or PTS slash two. Okay. What are these things? This is kind of stupid and it's kind of funny too. But say if you wanted to go ahead, <laughs> you can send messages to different terminals throughout your terminal. All right. Say if you had like 45 people in a computer lab all drinking their coffees and you know talking about how they're going to do Linux. I don't know who assembles though, like 45 people like all together at one time anymore. You know what I mean? It's like everybody's got internet. So why move out of your house? <laughs> but <clears throat> you could say something like, say this. You could say, um, hey Gus. Um, still drinking? Okay. You could send that to another user. Say if you were all together in a nice little clustered area on the same LAN or whatever like that. And you could SSH into his computer. You could say that. And you would then say that, echo that into a dev. PTS. I'm going to say 2. Now let's see. There you go. Okay. You can share messages from terminal to terminal. All right. And this particular message, we're asking Gus if he's hitting the bottle or not. All right. So <clears throat> you can share from terminal to terminal. Okay. You could even have said SSH, SSH into, um, you know, um, my LAN. No, no, no way. SSH into corporate corporate at <laughs> corporate at 192.168.1.1 okay <clears throat> you could SSH into corporate okay <laughs> you could SSH into corporate I, I don't know I'm just trying to, trying to provide like a <clears throat> uh, a base, uh, a basis for where like 450 people will be all together, so you could share messages <clears throat> in this type of way. You could SSH in there and say something like, um, <laughs> "Cuss, <laughs> are you, are you on the wagon? Are you on the wagon this week?" Gus. <laughs> Alright? And I'll tell you one thing. If Gus is on the wagon, he'll probably be off the wagon by the time this day is through. Alright? <clears throat> you can send messages back and forth. Okay, yeah, great. Who cares about little funky little programs, say messages or e-speak or anything else like that? But the fact of the matter is, <clears throat> how are we printing this? What are we doing when we do this? Let's say PS Aux again. See, we have two windows open. Are two terminals open? How do we know they're terminals? Well, um, experience. But this isn't that. Why is it called PTS? It makes no sense to me. I don't know. And why is there one and two? Hmm. I don't know. It's kind of funky. Kind of. Kind of. I don't understand that. Well, let's take a trip. Let's take a trip out of root. And let's take a trip into our root file system. Okay. And let's go into our device folder. Clear list. <coughs> We're back in here, and PTS, PTS is in our device folder. I'm going to use the uptick here. Actually, I can't because I sudoed out. Let me say sudo su, and I'm using the uptick, uh, up arrow here, and I want to show you our previous command. <clears throat> okay? And I wish it wasn't so small. Um, um, clear. Let me bring it up to the top. There we go. <clears throat> so, 
I echoed a message into the dev PTS dash two or slash two. Okay. Basically I shot this from my current location wherever that was. I echoed this into I put it into can you say standard in maybe? I don't see why it wouldn't be standard in. Right? I echoed this from wherever I was, if I was on my desktop, I echoed this through the dev folder into the PS PTS two. Okay? Which happens to be exactly where we are now. This is the PTS folder. Why is our terminal running in, in, a, in a dev folder? Is our terminal a device? This is the dev folder, this is a device folder, right? This is in the folder with CD-ROM, CD-ROM 1, CD-ROM RW, console, mm, that dead giveaway, De uh, DVD, floppy drive, I don't know what that is. Input, our K message, we have messages coming through the device folder. We got um, mapper, memory, net, uh, what else do we got in here that looks cool? Random, oh yeah, random is in the device folder. You dev random, you ever hear of that? Alright, generates a random code. If you say um, TTY, if anybody's familiar, if you hit Control alt f one you'll be at TTY, right? And that's a teletype, can we say teletype maybe? No, teletype terminal, okay? But why did these go up so high? Why did these why did these ever go up so high? You don't have that many F keys. That's insane. Okay? Dev zero. Okay. Um I've talked about that. You filled your dev with dev zero. You zero out your hard drive. USB, USB, um your USB USB stuff goes here. So when you plug in your USB, it's all in here. Why? Why is the terminal so so far? <clears throat> SDA one and two. All your hard drive work is in here. Okay. SDD, SDE. Okay. SDG. O. All that stuff like that. But why is our terminal in our device folder? All right. Because <clears throat> this operates as a a user program. Okay. Even when we sudo as root. We're st we we are still accessing the kernel. Unlike DOS, we cannot write physically directly to the hard drive like DOS can. Okay, DOS is ancient, and they they were unable to improve that. Okay, but we operate as a user program over top of the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel is the decision maker and what to lay in, good, bad, and different. Or or if you type in fire, it'll lay it in. All right, with no, no verbose statements. Sometimes even that. Okay, but there is a layer of abstraction. Okay, there is a layer of abstraction. Why do you think when we download executable files, okay, we have to change permissions to them? We have to actually give it permissions to run. Unlike users, or unlike Windows, we can make an executable somewhere, ship it over online, and just throw it right into the root of the system and schedule it to run, and it will run. Right, because <clears throat> it, it the user permissions are not so complex as with the, the Linux kernel. You saw how many users were going on here, okay? But the Linux kernel <clears throat> uses a device folder to go ahead and um, throws in even your terminal, your console, okay? And one of the reasons why is and you'll notice this too, if you, <coughs> you'll notice why these are so high, these TTYs are so high over here, because at any time if you ever were disconnected, it'll pick a new device for you, okay? Because the kernel just, um, I want to say the kernel keeps on going, but basically, <coughs> instead of wasting time and energy to find, um, Instead of wasting time and energy to find TTY4 all the time, it'll skip you. It'll skip TTY4, and when you make an access, or when you make a request to start a new terminal, it'll dish you out something that is available or whatever it wants to give you, okay? And it may turn to TTY5, okay? Same thing with our dev folder, all right? Let's take a look at that. Let's, let's go. Eh. 
let's let's for one let's PS aux right now. Okay? If we PS aux right now, we'll find out that we have two terminals open. Why? From experience I know that we have a PTSO and a PTS2 open at the same time. Okay? Now I'm gonna go over here and let's give Gus a break. Cut him off. Okay? So we can PS aux now and find out we only have one open. Let's go over here, control alt T. Okay? Now we have one more terminal open. Now if we say PS aux again, you'll notice it was the same same it was the same desktop. I have you know that's another thing Windows doesn't have is alternative desktops, right? I love it. I got seven across the bottom. I aim them up right over the over the um the uh, monitor, right? The logo of the monitor, I center it right up there and it's just beautiful. Beautiful. Any any <laughs> if anybody was noticing either or wanting to know, control alt right arrow, control alt right arrow or left arrow was switching between those desktops. So if you don't want to use the mouse like me, like you know, when you play that game as a kid, like don't touch the ground, it's lava. You know what I'm saying? I don't like to use the mouse at all. <laughs> Alright, except for pointing. But you look here and you see that we created another terminal in the same window space, and why is it terminal three? I don't know. Let's cut it off. Let's open one up again. Okay? And now let's go back and let's say PS Lock one more time. You see, same same window. Okay? A closed terminal. Okay? And what happened was since it's a device, since it is a device, clear, let's say list. Since it is a device, it just skips us and keeps on going and creates a new a new um a new window that's all it does the same thing with your usb device okay when you plug it in and you unplug it should it have to waste all that time to go back and find out where it was before and then match everything up and sync it together and make sure that these things match up and the driver why should it do that? Every time you unplug it and plug it back in, it comes in as a new service, okay? And it comes as a new service and is allotted a different slot in the device folder, okay? Or in memory, all right? Okay. The UDEV random does that, okay? Actually, the UDEV random um, works on other parts, um, on other things. I forget what they are, but... Uh, how do you think you can, well, that's a bad analogy, but UDEV random works on different things, so, so when you plug things in, they will have a random name to them, okay, because you don't want to plug in, say, if you have a USB stick and you call it one, you don't want to plug in another USB stick that you, um, in the same slot, and it'll be called one, no, because there's different stuff, I could be screwing that all up, all right, but maybe one day we'll go over UDEV random. But the random facilitates, okay, the adding of ad the adding of space or the adding of these these areas, okay? Um let's go into PTS and see what happens. See the end of PTS. Okay. We got this so far, but you know what? We can go up PTS seventeen. Alright? So try that sometime if you want to. Right? PS aux and look at your stuff. Look at your stuff and see what's going on back there. Right? Same thing if we plug in like a different hard drive. Okay? Well, SDA1 and SDA2, that's stuff on the hard drive and everything else like that, so it'll give it names and everything else. But, um, particularly when you go back with USB stuff, okay? It, at the finer elements, it changes stuff like that. Okay? Now, <clears throat> of course you're not going to plug in, you're not going to plug in SDB1 and it's going to come up like TTY7, that's not the case at all, alright? But when it comes to other things like these terminals over here, okay, that constantly, when you close them, open them, close them, open them, close them, open them, I mean, it would take forever for you to get your memory back, it would f take forever for you to get those type of things back. So that's why it's a good reason why you should have um, this look in this folder here. It's great. RF kill. Alright, root. Root is even in a device folder. Alright, it's just great. It is great. What else can I talk about in the device folder? Hmm. RAM. 
I don't really have anything else to say. I just would like to, to tell you um, how, how our operating system is different than DOS. So, that is one point made. Alright? Yeah, we got time. Don't worry about it. Let's, um, let us, let us leave this here, and we'll CD, we'll CD into Home Doug, my desktop. Okay? Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's, I want to show you a, f uh, not a functionality, that's the difference, not a functionality with DOS CMU, but a quirk. Am I done with device, how we run as device folders? I'm not sure. I am not sure. Eh, I think I covered most of it. If I'm wrong, <laughs> I'll come back. <laughs> I'll just do another one. Alright, let's skip it for now and keep going. Oh, man, we're still in the same thing. Let's go home. Doggy desktop, right? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> now from here, let's type in DOS EMU. Now, if you were like me and did not... <laughs> if you were root like me when you installed this, maybe you have to say sudo DOS EMU, alright? Or maybe DOS EMU runs as sudo anyway. I don't know, alright? But I'm gonna say it's pseudo DOS EMU. Okay? I'm gonna show you a quirk about um actually this is how I stumbled upon the, the device topic. I'm gonna show you a quirk about DOS EMU when you run it at different layers as a user. Okay? Let's say dir. Alright? <clears throat> take a close not close, but take a quick gander at our file system or what is in there, our directory structure and everything else, okay? Okay. Now, let's go to another window. And I'm going to run, that was at an elevated user, I'm going to run as sudo su now. I am super root, okay? And right now, I'm going to start up DOS EMU. And take a look at the differences. Clear. Um, dir. Okay? These here, this, and this, of course it's not going to keep it highlighted. This, look at this directory structure, and you'll notice we're a little light. We are a little slim compared to this directory structure over here. Okay? This may happen to you. Alright? This may happen to you. And you may get a little confused because I know sure as beans on a coffee tree <laughs> that this happened to me and I was a little confused okay I'm gonna show you what's going on there too and let's close this out okay I am in root over here exit exit goodbye okay <clears throat> there is in fact a difference there must be a difference there must be a difference there is a difference between if, if this was not true, there must be a difference between sudo user or sudo, um, sudo, for example, sudo Doug, sudo username, okay, sudo, what I'm trying to say is there must be a difference. There must be a difference between an elevated user, okay, and a root root user. Okay, considering that our terminal is a user program. All right. So uh, when I said there must be a difference between super user, of course, and an elevated user. Okay. Now in this instance, Doggy, if I ran a program right now, like say DOS EMU. If I ran this program, all right, um, I if I could use it as this as just a user, if this would execute properly, sure. Okay, well, DOS EMU, I have to do it super user style, all right. But there must be a difference between sudo username, logging in that way, and sudo su. Okay, now I'm super root and in. I think. Okay, I could be totally wrong. Most likely, 
And if and if I ever got exposed for that, I'd be like, people would be like, oh, you you are screwed up with Linux, and you don't know what the hell you're talking about. And I watched your tutorials, and I I figured out Linux off of you, but you're a sham. <laughs> I would have no rebuttal for that. And I'm sorry. This is what I see. This is what I think. According to DOS CMU. Now, DOS CMU cannot only be some type of super funky program from outer space that the only program that does this. Alright? Alright? This has to be the case. This could be the case. But this is my basis for why I believe that. Okay? And I do believe that. Especially with DOS CMU. Alright? Okay. So, like I said, like I said, like I said, like I said, sudo. Mm hmm. sudo dos emu. I want to go. Well, you know what? I don't want to go. Maybe if you have, a, I hope you have a Windows. Do you have, does anybody have a Windows 5 machine? Come on, quit playing around. You know, you, you listen, everybody's used Windows at one time or another. Hell, I'm still dual booting dual boot windows I had to sever that thing like a like a bad girlfriend on that you know what I mean I had to challenge myself to even just straight straight use Linux for everything matter of fact the other day you know what? I'm not even gonna lie to you I had a book to read dude I did not have a I didn't I don't like reading at all all right I downloaded a PDF all right I've had a PDF and you know what I'm gonna tell you what does not cut it. What does not cut it in Linux? Espeak. Yeah, right. It'll read to you, but man, we ain't Johnny Five in it. I can't handle that. It's a little off. You know what I'm saying? And I've looked for programs to to a speech or a text to speech synthesizer that was not very good at all. And I was tempted the other day. All right, I was tempted the other day to boot up in my Windows Seven side. All right, and I got a nice text-to-speech um, AT&T natural voices uh, thing over there, and it's got. I was so tempted to put my PDF in there and have it convert to like, what was it, Julie? Julie read pretty good. <laughs> I can listen. All right, but I could not convert. <clears throat> well, I could not. What the hell am I talking about? I didn't do it. Is what? All right, I would do it right now. All right, I I would so if I had to read something, and and yeah, you could go to Google Translator, but you know what? That, that shit like times out like every so often on you. All right, and if I had a nice size PDF to read, like a nice ten pager, yeah, right. Especially on like some Hamlet or some crap, Pfft, man. E speak. I mean, text to speech. That thing. All right. I could put it in a virtual box, or I could use Wine. Yeah, I could use Wine. But, you know, if anybody's got, <laughs> somebody's got to have an old Windows system around somewhere that c that's capable of running DOS. Alright, somebody's got to have that. Come on, guys. I mean, you know, Windows sucks, but we've all done it. Go in there in your debug. Look at the contents of memory. Even if you can, pull up that same location I had down on my other video that I shot with my phone. I, and that was down in OO. Where was it? Code segment. Um, dump. Code segment. Oh. oh, oh. <laughs> R R C X. R C S. O O O O. Dump. Code segment. O O O O. Go down here. Take out your Windows 5 machine. Take out your Windows NT machine. Take out your DOS 3.1 machine. If you have one, oh my god. Eh? Take out your floppies. <laughs> Go down here in this contents of memory. Alright? Go down here in the contents of memory. What I don't think would work, and this is pretty true, I don't think this will happen on FreeDOS. FreeDOS is uses the uh, Linux kernel, so I don't think you'll be able to punch crap right into the back of the operating system with that, right? Um, but, you know do that. Do it anyway. Who cares? What can you hurt? You know what I'm saying? Check it out. Check it out. Go around in the deep root of there and see exactly what's going on back there. And I'm telling you, these are the differences that I think. 
So, alright, my mouth is getting dry. I'm done talking right now. So, I'll see you guys later. And on the next toot, I had a, I had a nice stack of toots. I had a nice, nice video lined up that I did. I did I did three nice videos. I had machine code in it and everything else. And psh, they were nice and elaborate and informative and descriptive and short. And psh, yeah, I screwed them all up. <sighs> you guys have a super day wherever you are in the world. I hope your day is always shiny and gold at your fingertips. <laughs> Kill. Kill 2375. Have a great day.